forward. Thank you, Zoom. Um, hopefully everyone just got that announcement that the meeting is being recorded. Um, so hello everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Danielle Nista, and I'm one of the reference associates at New York University in New York City. Um, I'll renew my introduction about five minutes into the call just to catch any newcomers who join us in the next couple of minutes. Um, but on behalf of the TPS call organizers, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. We're really looking forward to the content of this call. I know this is a hot topic for everyone right now with reopening and plans for instruction in the fall. Please take whatever you need from this hour, whether it's helpful tips from colleagues um, or just some human connection. Um, if this is your first time joining us, this is our 11th call since the end of March. Um, you can find recaps of previous calls as well as list of resources and ideas in our robust crowdsource document, which will be linked in the chat. Um, I'd also like to really reiterate that all are welcome on these calls. These conversations are a joint product of members of the Instruction and Outreach Committee of the Rare Books and Manuscripts section, uh, the TPS section of the Society of American Archivists, and other affiliates. We seek to build a forum for educators using primary sources in any cultural heritage institution. So please do tell your friends and colleagues to join in on the next call. So I'm going to go ahead and post some slides right now, if you give me just a moment. Okay, so a couple of announcements before we begin our call. Um, the TPS Unconference is going virtual. Please complete a short survey by June 16th to help the organizers plan an event that will serve the entire community. Um, the link to that survey will be in the chat. Um, if you are interested in volunteering um, during the unconference, please email teachwithstuff at gmail.com. Help is especially needed um, for the tech team, and the requirement to be on the tech team is a willingness to learn. Um, so you don't have to be a tech expert by any means, um, and they would really appreciate any help. But if there's another uh, way you can lend your support, more than welcome to email teachwithstuff at gmail.com. Uh, please also sign up for the TPS Collective Listserv. Um, you can follow the link in the chat to sign up. Um, and if you do so, you'll receive email notifications about upcoming calls, um, as well as an opportunity to collect, connect more with colleagues. Um, you can feel free to use the listserv um, to post any questions or any resources that you find helpful that you think the entire community would like to see. Um, next, we are also always seeking volunteers to get involved with planning and presenting for the TPS calls. So if you have a teaching tool that you'd like to present, please follow the link in the chat to sign up. We also have a TPS call feedback survey, which I'll be discussing more in just a moment. Um, and if you would like to help with planning future calls and don't have the chance to sign up right away, um, you can stay on um, the line after we finish our uh, general meeting for today. Um, and we'll have a discussion um, with the planning community, the planning committee to plan um, what our next call will be. And speaking of that next call, it will be on Tuesday, June 23rd, um, 9 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time or 12 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time and all the time zones in between. Um, more information will be forthcoming on the listserv about this call, so keep an eye out for that. And like I said, if you want to help plan, just stay on the call. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, I am recording the beginning of the, this call for the panelist discussion, but we will not be recording the Q&A session. Um, we will provide high-level anonymized notes of the Q&A session um, for future reference, but like I said, they won't have anybody's identifying information. Um, we just want to get an idea of some of the topics people might like to discuss about reopening for the future. As I mentioned previously, we are conducting the survey to gather information about how the group will move forward um, for call topics and structure. If you haven't filled out the survey yet, please do so after the call. The link is in the chat. Thank you to all who have already filled it out. Um, and we're just going to share some more of our findings right now. At this point, we've had over 110 responses, um, and we've learned that about 86% of you come from academic libraries, um, with the next highest percentage from government archives. Um, the topics um, that people are most interested in hearing about, unsurprisingly, planning for fall semester is the top one, more demos on tech tools, um, and using data and digital humanities in teaching. Um, because of the response to the call frequency, we have opted to make calls every other week for now, but we will keep you posted if that changes. Um, this week's call will be a set of presentations followed by large group discussions as per the results of the survey that you can see on your screen. Um, and this format seemed to be people's most preferred one, but we are taking into account that people do have a wide variety of interests, so we will vary the structure of the calls. 
Um, the planning committee will also be meeting soon to look at the results of people who are interested in presenting topics. So we will be reaching out as soon as we set schedules. Thank you again for volunteering with your interest. Um, as you can see, these results of the survey are really informing the decisions that we're making. So if you have not let your voice be heard, please do so um, either right now or after the call is over. Um, all right. So for those of you who have recently joined the call, um, once again, my name is Danielle Nista, and I'm one of the reference associates at New York University um, Special Collections in New York City. Um, and on behalf of my uh, co-workers on the TPS call, um, committee, I'd like to thank you all once again for joining us today. So without further ado, let's get into today's topic. Um, this week, we will focus on reopening for the fall semester. It's right around the corner, and I know it's on everybody's minds. We just had a whole staff meeting at NYU devoted to that today, so we're getting ready. Um, I am absolutely delighted to welcome three of our colleagues whose work represents a variety of experiences and institution sizes. Um, first, Jay Marie Bravent, Director of Research Services and Education at the University of Kentucky. Ron McCall, um, the Special Collections Librarian at Westchester University. And Katie Henningsen, Head of Research Services at Duke University. Um, they will be giving us three 10 minute presentations on their particular institution's fall reopening plan. Um, and then following those presentations for about 20 minutes or until the end of the hour, we'll have a Q&A and discussion um, that will be open up to everyone. Please make sure you hold your verbal questions until after all the presenters have gone, but feel free to react in real time and post questions in the chat. Um, we have two lovely chat moderators, Jen Hoyer and Heather Smedberg are going to be moderating that for us today. Um, just briefly before I turn it over to our speakers who will speak about their institution's plans, I wanted to read through some quick community norms to help guide our discussion. Um, so as a community, we agree that we will nurture and create a community that is inclusive of all, um, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender identity, age, sexual orientation, or stage of professional development. We will respect the variety of perspectives and of methods for reopening, um, understanding that everyone is beholden to different government and institution driven decisions. We will aim to provide suggestions that prioritize the safety of people who work with primary sources, including but not limited to library and archives workers, teachers, researchers, and students. We will be mindful of the privacy of others when sharing back strategies we take from this session and will understand when colleagues on this call are limited in the information they can share. We will actively listen to participants and engage thoughtfully with one another. We will be sensitive to the anxieties and concerns of our colleagues and offer solidarity and support wherever it is sought. So thank you in advance for following these norms. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to our first speaker, Jay Marie Bravent. Okay, uh, Jay Marie, I think you're still oh. muted. <clears throat> There we go. There you are. There we go. Okay. Are we screen Perfect. shared? Working? Okay, great. So thanks, Danielle. Um, good morning, good afternoon, buenos dias to everybody who's joined us today. We're so glad that you're here. I want to thank the uh, TPS Collective and Planning Group um, for allowing me to speak today. Uh, my name is Jane Marie Bravent, and um, I use uh, gender neutral pronouns, they, them. And uh, I believe this is a really important time for our profession, very important time for our country um, generally and for our lives more broadly in so many ways. So I think that we're, our discussion today has a lot of intersections of, of events going on and, and I hope that our discussion can help ease people's concerns and hopefully lead to a way that we can speak together as a profession about our concerns. Um, I'm gonna start off by saying that my slides have a lot of text, which is not normally how I do presentations. I'm not going to go through all of the text and all of the slides, but I wanted the context to be available since I knew this was gonna be recorded and available um, to folks to kind of go through later and sift through. As part of that, if anybody has any questions afterwards, I'm absolutely welcome please uh, to, to discuss it. Please get in touch with me um, at any time you know, as the summer goes along. Um, so for most, like most of you, I still have more questions than answers, um, but I think that it's important that we prioritize the safety of our employees, the safety of our patrons, all of our patrons, our students, anyone who's using special collections, and that we also try to maintain a high quality um, set of services of research, for, uh, research support and the integrity of our teaching programs. Um, but we also need to be thinking deeply and acting to affirm equity, diver uh, diversity, inclusion, and fairness as we move forward. 
So I also want to point out, oops, um, just a recommendation, recommendation. There was an excellent presentation that was sponsored by ACERL that Brenda Burke at Clemson put together. I think that was just last week. Um, it's, it's very much uh, modeled on um, the same kind of structure that we're looking to use to, to reopen. So I'm not going to duplicate what was in that presentation. I'm going to talk specifically about some other details, but I would highly encourage anybody um, who hasn't yet to watch this, this presentation or to go through the slides that are provided. So real quickly, um, the reason I'm here is because of my role in special collections. I'm part of the leadership cohort. There are five directors and our associate dean at the University of Kentucky and the Special Collections Research Center is an associate library. Um, and the, the entire library system is considered a college. And at UK, all of the colleges have been um, given the directive to set up their own reopening plans that follow the campus guidelines. So we're still very much in the middle of all of that. And as you can see, my roles in special collections are basically the great big chunk of areas where humans and physical materials interact with each other and the physical spaces and humans interact with each other. Um, just briefly, a little timeline. Again, I'm not going to go through all these points, um, but the first case of COVID-19 was identified and uh, announced to the public on March 6th, even though it was pretty clear that the virus had been in the community for several weeks ahead of this. Um, as of March 12th, we were still being told to operate as normal, um, but by March 18th, we were closing to the public. And then just like everybody else for six weeks, we hunkered down. Um, our statewide cases peaked and then plateaued between April 29th and May 4th. And that same week was when budget pr uh, priorities for campus and the deep budget cuts were beginning to be announced. Um, in the middle of that, campus uh, started to form reopening groups and draft plans. Uh, three groups uh, campus-wide were formed. I am not part of any of the larger campus groups. Um, and then on the heels of that, uh, internal library reopening groups were also formed. Um, those three groups are mostly focusing on the main library and the branches, and Special Collections is creating its own plan separate from those plans. We submitted our first draft on May uh, 22nd. I think it was the day that I agreed to do this presentation. I thought, yes, we have a stable plan that I can talk about, except we didn't really have a stable plan as it turns out. Um, we were asked to make revisions the following week. Um, our initial plan included operating completely remotely for the fall, which is what we had been told to plan for was a completely remote fall. Um, we were then told that we needed to open for in-person research, which completely changed what our plans were going to be. Um, on May 27th, however, um, Kentucky was only was one of only three states that was meeting the CC, uh, CDC guidelines for reopening thing, uh, all kinds of things. And um, they announced that libraries uh, could begin their earliest reopening as of June 8th. So here is the graphic showing Kentucky, New York and Alaska as one of the few states that were meeting the initial guidelines for reopening. So on the heels of that good news, we thought at the time was good news, um, we submitted our second draft and um, then the library groups are still working um, June 5th through 10th, that's right now. We had a town hall meeting this morning and those groups are still working. So now we're expecting um, the report and the beginning of the creation of a central guiding document to actually commence next week. And then we were still hoping that there may be some sort of a final plan for the library wide system, uh, maybe by the end of next week. With, of course, the continuing caveat that at any moment um, things could change and we might have to go completely remote again. Um, for staffing and safety, we're prioritizing campus users as we move forward. We will not be having anybody who's not part of our direct campus community um, coming in for appointments for in-person research. Uh, at the moment, that's part of our plan. We're aiming for staff and faculty to return to the building around August 3rd. We're going to have a staggered schedule. Most folks will only be in the building one or two days a week. If they come into the building at all, we're still going to encourage remote work for most folks who can sustain that. Um, we're going to be required to follow our state and campus guidelines with masks, which is um, a continu continuing concern because at the moment we, we're not able to require them, even though that is the preference of most of the people, certainly on my team and across special collections that I've spoken to. Uh, we won't have anyone at the front desk. Our doors will be locked and people will be allowed into the building by appointment only um, by a, a staff person who's been designated to um, staff that appointment. Um, our building is about 100 years old. It is not designed for modern use, for modern space. The hallways are very narrow. The elevator is very small. Our shared office spaces are very tight. Um, so there's going to be one person at a time 
for a lot of these spaces. We're going to have six foot markers uh, on the floor in many areas, especially around some of the pinch points. And we're going to be limiting even the larger rooms to four or five people at a time. One of the things that I've been hoping to do in my role is to um, use data to help to inform our decision making. And so I'm going to have a couple of slides with some useful, useful data um, that we're looking at as we're making some of these decisions. Um, for class attendance, as you can see, we have um, a decent number of students, mostly undergraduates, who are coming through our building. Um, primarily, um, the largest amount of classes, usually up to 70 or so, happen in the fall semester. And because our building is small and we have a lot of these pinch points, um, we're not going to hold in-person classes for the fall. Um, and that really is dictated by our building. Uh, our Ford Center classroom is very small. On a good day, you can fit maybe 28 students in there, but with social distancing, we could probably barely fit five or six. So that's just not going to happen. And the Ford Center space is actually going to be taken over and used um, as um, quarantine space for incoming collections um, and acquisitions. We also have a, a very large giant classroom space that's called the Great Hall, which you would think would be a great place for social distancing. However, it is actually a hall. It is a big hallway. It's a pass through. So our research room opens to that space. Our stacks and um, university archives collection areas open to that space. Several offices open to that space. And there would be no way to coron off six foot spaces for all of the materials to continue to move through and to have people in that space with tables separated. It's just not going to work. It's just not logistically feasible. Um, in addition to quarantining class materials between classes, some days we might have 10 classes coming through the building in a day. I teach, Colleen teaches, Matt teaches. Uh, we have several other people in special collections who, who teach classes as well. Um, and we have overlapping materials. So that would be a concern. Also, the, because a lot of the college haven't, colleges haven't released their plans yet, we know that many of them are going to consider either hybrid or online courses for the fall, even if we open. Um, to have students on campus in the dorms. So we might not even really be able to um, move forward with that even if we wanted to. So these are the um, different ways that we're going to work with classes. Uh, there's going to be Zoom sessions. We're looking at the possibility of an hour with an archivist periodically throughout the semester. Um, we're going to do embedded instruction. We're going to be focusing on, us, on driving classes, projects, students, and the faculty to as many already digitized materials as possible. Um, we're going to look at alternative delivery platforms. We have a couple of modules that are already on LibGuides and we engage it with um, classes on Canvas, but we're going to look to expand that. Uh, we also have a really neat um, digital humanities uh, project that started this year called Create UK that's going to allow us to explore using things like Scalar and WordPress in classes. So we're going to try to take advantage of those platforms as well. Um, we've been looking, even though the budget is still kind of sketchy, we've been looking at the possibility of getting some live action document cameras. And um, we're also looking at uh, prioritizing some of our scanning if new class materials are necessary. So I'm going to run through a couple of uh, additional slides with data. Um, the BRR is our research room. And so as you can see, if we limit our users to just campus users that cuts us down to about 58 percent of our user base which is still significant but also gives us um, a little bit of room we're, we're, we're thinking we're hoping we'll see how this goes we haven't just we haven't really talked in great depth about how we're going to communicate all of these things to the 42 percent of our patrons who are very very important to us but who come from outside the uk community on how we're going to be able to serve them remotely um, for the duration of whatever this is. Um, and then as you can see, uh, for the visitors, it, the UK campus visitors, only 55% are undergraduate students. And that's really driven by the, uh, the teaching program and our classes. So we're expecting that as a lot of that moves online, we won't see as many of those in-person visits as may have been uh, seen in the past. And um, we're also using Aon data to um, figure out how to do our appointments. At the moment, we've been talking about having appointments on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays, since they're our most in-demand days, and looking at two-hour appointment blocks, since we know our average um, visit is just under two hours. Um, and then also staffing, which is something I can talk a little bit more in the Q&A, but at the moment, um, we do not have um, a research services manager, archivist, or assistant. Those positions are vacant, and as part of the budget, um, pretty much all the vacant positions are going to be cut. So this is a concern moving forward for not just for reference, but also for teaching support because these are the people who pull materials for classes and then also um, 
our whole program is based on you know integrating pedagogy from the classroom into the research room all the way through a student's experience at UK. So how do we maintain that high quality and continuity of that experience when we're kind of limited on staff and we're looking at other functional areas. Am I getting close to time, Danielle? Okay, we let me just speed through this real quick. Um, my timer yeah, just about. <laughs> My timer should have told me, but it hasn't done yet. So, um, so just here's here's our um, reference data where where a lot of that goes. Um, we're looking at again appointments. Um, maybe three researchers. And as I know, a lot of people are talking about ventilation and the research room space. We have a humongous research room, so ventilation isn't really an issue. We can space out people pretty well, but the lockers is where the pinch point really happens. So that's our main concern and why we're limiting it to three people. Um, so this is the summary. Um, this is something I'd like to talk more about later. Um, our hopes and dreams and goals are to prioritize safety, to advocate um, with data, to inform our decisions, and to keep as much remote as possible. Um, our team mindset is to stay flexible, uh, adjust our expectations, to focus on sort of plan, plan, and then prepare to have no plan, and to prioritize high impact and time sensitive. And then I, I do have to say our campus administration has been great. They are communicating with us on a daily basis. They're really being transparent in this process. So we do have a lot of trust and faith that they really do have our safety and health and well-being um, at the top of their list. And then I just have two quick uh, things. What I feel like I, this is all I feel like I know. I know that we can socially distance and that works. I know that face masks work. I know that isopropyl alcohol is still the best thing. Please don't, please don't bring bleach into the archives. <laughs> <laughs> and um, also the risk level has not changed, which I think is really important for us to continue to say. Um, and then, of course, here's a bunch of questions that we still don't have the answer to, and I look forward to talking with everybody more about um, where they are with these questions and um, where we can go as a community to stand as one voice um, in answering these questions. So, thank you so much. If anybody wants to get in touch with me, here's my contact information. Thank you so much, Jay Marie. We're going to go ahead and turn it over really quickly now to Ron McCall. Okay, and Ron, I think you're still muted. How's that? There you go. Okay. All right. So um, thank you for having me um, today. And I, I'm going to bring things from a different perspective, I think, um, than Jim Ray, certainly. Um, we are a very small staff and department at uh, Westchester University. While the university itself is, is relatively um, good sized. Um, our staff has always been quite small and um, at the moment, uh, you know, there's some uncertainty, of course, about the future. So just to give you some background, um, we, we are uh, two full-time staff members. So I am the special collections librarian and I have a full-time technician. I also have a part-time technician. Uh, beyond that, we depend on student uh, support, work study, interns, and so on. But um, to further complicate things and to show how um, maybe some other people are in the same position um, as far as size or resources, um, our department was pretty much dormant and closed to faculty and the public for about two years while um, we went without a librarian. And I just started last fall. So I'm also in the process of trying to build relationships and convince um, faculty and students that we exist, uh, that the door is, is now open. Um, and then of course this comes along. So um, I'm, I'm gonna have a new challenge in convincing faculty and so on. But um, I'm trying to look at this as a positive. I was happy Danielle said that um, we should be focusing on that and um, you know, rather than just complaining. And, and I, I think we all went through a period of that initially so I spent some time lamenting the work we needed to do to return, but that soon got old and I reframed the situation and I'm trying now to anticipate realizing a return on the work that we now need to do. So I love my job and it's gonna be different this fall, of course, but um, some things about the challenge that's now presenting itself uh, um, actually remind me why I like it so much and I think are right up our alley. So 
the fact is no two days are ever the same. And I know that's, that's kind of a cliche. And I think what that really means is every day has surprises and we certainly have some now. So even the unpleasant surprises become great stories to tell later. And every day is about change already. So um, now we get, you know, another chance to do the five things I have listed here. I think we're, we're always good at this. And so we just need to turn to our, our own skill set already adapt, create, inspire, share, teach. And of course, there's much more to it than that, but I think that's um, a good kind of credo to keep in mind. Um, advance my slide here. We are, you know, still in the process, unfortunately, because I, I probably because of our institutional size, um, we are nowhere near uh, the planning that um, Jim Ray just articulated, for instance. So I can't even put up, uh, much text at all in my slideshow, unfortunately. I'm kind of looking at this as a personal um, endeavor because the, the department is small and so much falls on me. So I'm thinking about how are we communicating, uh, how are um, me and my staff, how are we actually uh, situated within a larger context here. So we're, we're learning with the library um, what we're going to do. We're contributing to some of those discussions, but our committees dedicated to different aspects of reopening are just getting off the ground. So there are really no concrete plans being uh, sent to us and our contributions are still in the initial stages there as well. Um, but eventually we will learn from the library administration and these committees uh, what it is that's expected of us uh, that we really can't deviate from. Although most of it's ultimately gonna fall again on me and my staff to plan this out. So with my staff, I figure um, we will be anticipating um, some scenarios, maybe the worst case scenarios, um, and figuring out how we are comfortable dealing with those, even if we aren't comfortable dealing with those, and we decide these are certain things we don't wanna face. Um, we're gonna commit though together after we talk, and um, we're sort of doing that now as we talk each week uh, to finding a way that we can still serve as many people as possible. Our faculty, I think, are really uh, key here, and I, I hope to assure them that we're going to have service. Um, it may look different, and, they, and I'm sure they understand that, but I want to gauge from them what they're going to need, um, solicit from them uh, their goals and what they still hope to, to get out of a modified instructional plan for the fall, and make suggestions for tools, um, ideas, platforms, resources I can share that will help them support their students. Unfortunately, the last people we're going to be communicating with are students, um, but when that time does come, um, I want to work hard to convince them that we can still support them and that, um, you know, our staff is dedicated. We may not um, be able to host them in the same way, but that the resources are still at the ready for them. So um, I'm, I'm thinking too, because this is so personal and I'm picturing myself in our space all the time about ways we potentially can actually have people in our room. Um, our reading room I reconfigured last year so that it's um, more amenable to teaching and hosting classes. And of course, even if we have a very small group in now, um, I'm thinking about how do we space them properly, but I'm also thinking about the materials themselves. And so I, I, I imagine having tables where we have um, prepared the night before, we've actually spread out handouts so that they're not in a common pile that everyone has to draw from, but rather uh, no one will be touching any items that someone else has touched. Um, I'll spread out my business cards. I'll never have to walk up and hand anyone anything uh, in, a, in, a, in a setup like this. And we can do this the night before, leaving several hours for these items to, uh, to sit out in the air. Uh, you know, we're also closely wa watching the science on this, and <laughs> making sure we are following the best practices and so on. But I think it's important that we continue to put as much, or that maybe we pivot now and do more of this, we actually put more things in students' hands, um, whether that's uh, sending them things that they can print or having handouts available to them, because we are gonna nevertheless sacrifice some of the material hands-on experience as we can touch a collection. <clears throat> uh, a little, Further thinking I was doing is, you know, I don't want to simply deny students the experience of seeing things um, that, that really turn them on when they come. And so let's say uh, students are able to visit, you know, it'd be easy to just limit and prohibit, but I still want to exhibit. So I'm thinking um, outside the box here, I guess, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, sleeved items that might already be in sleeves or loose um, items, say letters, 
items that might be flat, we could spread across an exhibit table and then have a polyethylene overlay. We have plenty of that lying around just waiting to be used for something like this. And I think this would send a stronger message to students as they approach that this is a kind of a hands-off uh, table. They are not to be touching these items. When we have individual items sleeved, uh, students are still eager to touch them. And um, you, despite our warnings and um, so on. So, but I think a, a, a large sheet over them would probably um, be a stronger cue for students to uh, not touch. And then we can easily just roll that up and discard it at the end of, at the, end of the day. So I'm kind of thinking uh, outside the box here uh, on how we can safely present materials and, and, and not sort of just hide them away, keep those things online all. So ultimately though, I'm thinking about enhancing instruction and I picture myself in the classroom um, and, and how it is I might do this. Luckily, I've been um, developing a new database that will actually, and I'll put it up here, uh, it's, it's something I'm tentatively naming Prime Ideas for Primary Resource Research. And it's a collection of research topics rather than our traditional um, finding aids or collection titles. I'm hoping to engage more students, and I was thinking about this before the, the whole epidemic uh, arrived, um, by interesting students in research topics. So, you know, the African American experience on campus, or, um, you know, uh, the, the history of uh, speakers that have been invited to campus, or these variations on either local themes or bigger ideas that are out there. Uh, and then also giving them a description of, of what this topic might be, giving them some guiding questions to get started. And in other words, meeting them much earlier in the research process and, and giving them an opportunity to select the research topic long before uh, they even arrive and they see my presentation and they see items themselves. So that they've maybe selected a topic and then when they see me, we can then start talking about items and collections, et cetera which I think is a little off-putting to many freshmen, especially it's intimidating. Um, some other things that um, I don't have much time left, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna run through here. Um, I plan to create video tutorials. Um, and what I'm, what I'm gonna add to those though, are views of the reading room and collections so that even if students can't visit us this year, they're getting a sense of what it's like, what the environment is like. And I, because I think that's such a powerful experience, of course, when they come, we all know that. Um, so at least to give them some taste of that virtually. Uh, creating and sharing primary source surrogates, I think, is going to be key and essential. Um, either sharing these with professors to post. I switched back to TPS since the MEI will be recorded. Um, to create and sh share research guide research guides, um, and also to broaden my primary research instruction beyond just local collections. So the students are gaining skills in how to search for primary resources beyond our our own holdings um, in, in, the, in the case that they may not be able to access our own collection. Um, I wanna give them the, at least the broader skills that they can take and use um, just about anywhere. So those are some of my personal thoughts um, and that's much different from the prior presentation because I don't think we're in the same stage of planning. Um, so I'm coming at this from a kind of um, individual perspective and in how I'm going to engage with uh, faculty and students. So hopefully that helps stimulate some thought. Thank you. All righty, thank you so much, Ron. And we're gonna pivot right ahead now over to Katie Henningsen. Thanks, Danielle. And thanks, Jay Marie and Ron. That was really, really great to hear of your plans. All right, we are sharing. So I just wanna start by thanking the organizers for having me today. Um, I really appreciate that. Um, I want to start by acknowledging the anxiety that we all face around returning to our buildings and collections. There are a lot of unknowns and moving parts to sort out, and I remind myself daily that it's okay to be uncomfortable as we work through these. I also want to acknowledge the privilege that I bring to this conversation in that I'm at a large, well-funded institution. I've previously been at a public institution and at a small liberal arts where I was the only special collections person for a number of years. So I understand that what I'm about to share is because is possible because of the size and funding of my institution. My hope is that there's pieces here that others can borrow from and that they'll be useful to all of you. I should also note that we've been borrowing and trading information with our institutions um, that are in the same planning stages with us. Um, this is a time more so than ever to trade knowledge and I'm grateful to the organizers for creating this space for us to come together each week. So let's dive into Duke. 
Our library's wide return to campus coordinating committee or RC3 consists of department heads and directors who are coordinating across the libraries. We have a liaison to the Duke administration planning team, which is looking at the university as a whole. From RC3, we have a number of spin-off groups, again, mostly department heads, who are coordinating specific areas and services. I'm currently serving on RC3, the public services group, and co-leading the Rubenstein Library, which is Duke's special collections re-entry group. It's been helpful to serve across all of these groups as I'm able to coordinate our responses to ensure that special collections is represented, stay, stays in line with the other areas of the libraries and what their plans are, and able to share developments with our staff as they impact us. Moving forward, I'm just going to focus on what we're doing within the Rubenstein Library or the RL as I'll most likely start referring to it. Um, for context, just so that since the other two presenters both gave this, we have about 40 people in our special collections. About 12 of us are in research services. And then we have about 16 people who do instruction. Um, so our return has been broken up into phases. So I'm going to address um, our instruction and reading room plans as I walk through each phase very briefly. We're currently in phase one, which is staff are working from home. In late April, we began talking about what a remote semester would look like in regards to our instruction program. Um, again, 16 people who do various levels of instruction in their area of specialty. These individuals operate autonomously, which allows us to meet a wide variety of needs and expectations from our faculty. As I looked at the various scenarios that Duke was considering for fall semester and likely into next spring, it became very clear that some, if not all, library instruction would have to be remote. Our classroom holds 15 comfortably, 20 if we're pushing, and social distancing is certainly not possible in that space. In recent years, we've started to hit capacity with our instruction program, and what we heard from deans um, was that they anticipated faculty would lean more heavily on the libraries during a remote teaching semester. So with all of that in mind, we decided to pivot. I worked with a couple of my colleagues at Duke to develop an outline of next steps, areas we needed to investigate to start preparing for remote instruction, these include investigating tools for video creation, drafting best practices for asynchronous and synchronous remote instruction, revisiting previous assignments and lessons as we think about relying more heavily on our digital collections. And the plan is to move toward a more centralized online instruction program with shared goals to maximize staff expertise and to limit repeated effort. By starting this in late April, it's been possible for our 16 instructors to sign up for projects that most interest them and help move us forward allowing each to contribute as they have time. I want to acknowledge here that we're all human. We all have different life circumstances that are going on in our own homes and that um, this is a tough time in a lot of different ways. So I wanted to be really cognizant that my staff have um, other things going on that they may need to prioritize and at times may not be able to participate as actively. And so allowing people to step in and step out has been really great. Phase two starts for us in about two weeks. This will be the first time that our staff have gone back into the building since mid-March. We have four staff going in shifts to do scanning for summer and fall instruction. RL staff have identified what materials they need for teaching, and we will be keeping the number of staff very low intentionally. This allows those staff going in to feel safe moving through our spaces and maintain social distance. And we can also maintain a one-to-one -one ratio on equipment, which means that each person will have their own scanner that only they touch They'll have their own book cart, et cetera. RC3, our library-wide re-entry group, has worked with Duke facilities and health and safety to ensure that our HVAC is ventilating appropriately, that hand sanitizer stations are installed, and that personal protective equipment and cleaning supplies are available to the small number of staff going into each building. And most importantly, that our spaces our staff occupy will be cleaned after every shift. During phase two, our instruction group will begin implementing the plans we identified during phase one, including creating a web page for our new service model for remote instruction. We'll also begin creating a small number of asynchronous and instruction videos we intend to use and to allow faculty to add to their course sites. And we'll be adding what we're calling teaching modules to our web page. These will be lesson plans drawing on digitized content that faculty and people at other institutions can adapt or use with minimal librarian facilitation. We have a team of seven graduate students doing summer fellowships through our archival expeditions program this summer. And those, those uh, students are creating teaching modules that we can put on our website that draw exclusively on our digital collections in preparation for fall semester. 
All of these ready to go resources will provide a wider range of options for faculty who are also teaching a full semester online for the first time and will allow our instructors to focus on courses they feel need more hands on guidance. Also in phase two, we're working more closely with our partners in the general library. We um, have shared training sessions coming up. My counterpart in the general library and I meet regularly to trade information on what our groups are working on and to align our communication strategies as we get ready to begin sharing out with faculty. Phase three is the start of our fall semester, which has been moved forward a week to mid-August. Our university has tentatively shared plans to have students on campus and to offer both remote and in-person instruction. We're expecting a formal plan at the end of the month with more concrete ideas about how many students that will be and what spaces have to reopen to them. We tentatively think we may reopen the reading room during phase three if classes resume on campus. We're currently identifying an appointment system, have decreased the capacity of our reading room, and we'll install signs when we return to mark off tables and six foot distances for our desks. Finally, we're planning to reduce hours to ensure cleaning and we'll dramatically change our service model to ensure social distancing for our staff and adequate quarantine time for materials. All of our staff, all, sorry, all of our services have planning documents and policy documents to ensure that staff have clear guidance and our next steps will be to explore how we communicate these changes to our external researcher base. Based on our instruction spaces and the labor involved in online instruction, I anticipate that we will offer online special collections instruction exclusively during phase three. Online instruction requires a different pedagogical approach, a comfort with operating in a digital environment, and quite frankly, is something that none of us who chose to work in special collections probably anticipated that we'd be doing. I'm not interested in our instructors trying to do the, all the things for all the people. It will not be successful and it's really not reasonable. Most of our staff will continue to work from home and can offer research and instruction support from there. Our group of instructors, despite operating autonomously over the years, have really come together to work through different aspects of remote instruction effectively, and I'm confident that we have a great model for fall. What I also wanna note about this model is that we can continue using these uh, teaching modules as we hit our instruction capacity once we are back to in-person teaching. I work with an incredible group of people and I'm just gonna take this moment to acknowledge some of them who are on this call and thank them for the great work that they are doing to develop and offer meaningful research and skill building instruction to Duke students. That's me. All right, get my video. Thank you so much, Katie, that was Awesome. I am. Thank you to all of our presenters. That was fabulous to hear from all of you guys. Um, I loved hearing about all the different approaches. Um, I'm going to go ahead now and stop the recording.